Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are in the world during our broadcast. I'm Julie Thompson Klein, and Gabrielle Bomber has asked me to help you think about interdisciplinarity for this conference that has so many important and related keywords, but their meaning often isn't tapped out. So we're going to do that for about the next 20 minutes or so. And to help you with this, there is a handout. You will uh, probably have been instructed on where to find it. It's online. And it'll help give you some more details that you can keep, you can print out, you can keep, and references also for further reading. What I'd like to do is, first of all, talk using the handout about some of the major trends that are going on in interdisciplinarity today. It's interesting that here we are on the eve of the 100th anniversary or so of interdisciplinarity because the first documented uses of the term were early in the century in social science research and in the general education and core curriculum movements. So we're ready for a birthday party here of sorts. And we want to keep the mandate here of thinking about how these key words intersect with what you're doing in Canberra and elsewhere. So on the second slide here, what we can see is that a number of different trends that have happened over time, and then we'll look at today's current trend lines. If you go to your handout on the first page, you'll see a number of them. For instance, the first one, interdisciplinarity has long been associated with the emergence of new fields and interdisciplines, and the most visible ones in the early part of the century were American studies and area studies as well as comparative literature. That was around the 30s and 40s of the 20th century. By mid-century, social psychology, biochemistry, molecular biology, radio astronomy, and cognitive science had joined that list along with material science. And then a lot of people associate interdisciplinarity with the 1960s and 70s where we saw quite a number of new fields emerging, including <clears throat> ones of great importance here, environmental studies and science, technology, and society studies. In addition, urban studies, black studies, women's studies, and a number of different culture-based fields through out the remainder of the 20th century, we also saw the rise of not only cultural studies, but clinical and translational science, as well as another area of interest to people here at the conference, global and international studies. This is very much a global event. And into the 80s, we also saw the expansion of commu um, communication studies and media studies, including the field I work in now, digital humanities. So we have that history that has produced also a number of different uh, fields, gerontology, peace and conflict studies, policy studies. So you can see that there's a very strong association there with the rise of new interdisciplines, <clears throat> ones where the major problems and questions are not adequately accommodated in the existing disciplines. We also see the second item here, bullet point on the PowerPoint, new syntheses, new theories, and new paradigms. For example, the rise at mid-last mid century of plate tectonics, as well as what's called the man-land shift in geography, focusing more attention on the built environment. In addition, if we're looking, talking about new theories and new paradigms, we would certainly include uh, two that are of importance here for this group, sustainability, uh, developing from modern modernization, sustainability, environmental science, and globalization. We also see, for those of us who have joined us to think about implications for health sciences, the shift from a disease model in medicine to a paradigm of health and wellness. We have representatives of the <coughs> U.S. National Cancer Institute in Canberra who will be reflecting on that. We've also seen a number of prominent initiatives. Interdisciplinarity has been associated very strongly with World War II, with defense-related research. In fact, the Manhattan Project to build an atomic bomb is often regarded as sort of the grandparent of major funded interdisciplinary projects. In addition, we see agricultural experiment experimentations, uh, stations that were focused on problems in national agricultural crops initiatives that were funded by governments to take care of those problems. And also, we see 
competition in science-based industries, particularly in the post-1970s in engineering, manufacturing. So that, that's quite a track record. When we look at those big items, though, it's also important to remember that there's a quiet daily flow of influence. There's borrowing of tools and methods across and different disciplines, the uh, borrowing of microscopy and disciplines where the instrument was not invented and shared instrumentation. These have been very strong drivers along with increased amount of collaboration and teamwork. We of course would want to think as also about the role of educational reform. I was talking a second ago about the 1960s and 70s. Certainly there's a strong legacy of experimental programs that dates from there, as well as the mainstreaming of general ed in general education. And a lot of reforms of the major, I think, uh, disciplinarity and interdisciplinarity are often treated as a dichotomy, but they're not. They are in each other's pockets, if you will, and so there are a lot of very important reforms that have occurred. The next thing on your handout at the bottom of the first side is the question of trend lines. Well, I would certainly target a number of other ones I've got. The first image you see in the upper right-hand corner of the PowerPoint here, slide here, is facilitating interdisciplinary research, which was a benchmark report in 2004 from the National Academies of Sciences in the U.S. They named four major drivers of interdisciplinarity, the increased complexity of nature and society, that thematic of, com thematic of complexity has been a strong driver, also the desire to explore problems and questions that aren't confined to a single discipline. For example, I, I never, I don't hear anybody ever say, I work on biology, but I hear a lot of people say, I work on cancer. So the problem becomes the driver. In addition, increased pressure to be working on societal problems. And this, the complexity of societal problems and sustainability in healthcare has also been a big driver for collaboration. So the interdisciplinary is often associated very closely with collaboration in team science. In addition, we see a heightened problem focus across the curriculum in the undergraduate curriculum as well as the graduate curriculum. Work, uh, courses that focus on conflict, injustice, health disparities, sustainability. We see, in addition, other drivers, and I've given you right there in the middle of the PowerPoint there, um, the screenshot of the cover of a new report on the Third Revolution, which is looking at the convergence of health life sciences physical sciences and engineering that is going on, working again on complex problems, particularly with strong biomedical drivers, but also indicative uh, of bioinformatics changes, the impact of that. We see it in fields such as tissue engineering. So again, a combination of a strong problem focus and coming together, I had mentioned before, as well, the changing relationship of disciplinarity and interdisciplinarity. Every discipline has a genealogy to some degree of interdisciplinary activities. And in addition to that, we've seen a lot of interdisciplinary research coming into discipline-based courses, which again dismantles that absolute dichotomy. We also see the shadow structure of IDR, interdisciplinary research, and IDS, interdisciplinary studies. And sometimes it's obvious in big centers, sometimes in name programs, but that shadow structure moves across the curriculum. We see the incorporation of interdisciplinary interests. I would also, I've got there on the far left, a, a screenshot of the Handbook of Transdisciplinary Research. And the, tr the ascendancy of transdisciplinarity is an important topic for us to be talking about. We will talk about that a little bit more in a second. But first, I think it's interesting, too, to look at the intersection. Here is the wordle. Which link, this is what linguists call a word cloud, a word cloud or a tag cloud, a word cloud of the keywords for this conference. And you can certainly see the interdisciplinarity, which is up there in the upper left hand corner. It intersects with systems dynamics, <clears throat> general. General systems thinking, general theory has been prominent over the latter half of the 20th century. We see intersections too with cybernetics and operations research, two of the other key words here. And in fact, those were prominent 
methodologies in the 1970s associated with interdisciplinarity, also complexity science, project management and team science, as well as action research and a variety of forms of interdisciplinarity. Sometimes it gets confusing what inter, multi, and trans mean, but I've put on the top of the back side of your handout there a nice layout that Dave Rossner and I put together for the National Academies of Science for the Committee on Convergence and Health that shows you some of the differences. And the key difference here is that interdisciplinarity is about integrating and link is linking and focusing as opposed to multidisciplinarity, which is you know, lining up different perspectives, but not having them be integrated in any conscious way or having teams coordinated to work collaboratively. Now, what this does is this really drives a new way of thinking about institutions. I've put on the upper right hand image there how we usually think about institutions. There are steps we have to climb into edifices that structure knowledge. It's a great image here. Um, rethinking institutions, I call to mind particularly Kathy Davidson and David Theo Goldberg's work. They propose that we don't think of institutions as those static steps in a static building, but as mobilizing networks. And I'm reminded as well of Michael Desertot's distinction between place and space. And I'd argue that what we're doing is we're spatializing a place such as school has stable boundaries and a fixed location. Space is a practice place. It's created through actions and practices. So if we think of what we're doing, not necessarily as being static in a structure, but as spatializing new practices, it's another way of thinking about how we institutionalize change. Also, I would call to mind the shift from structure to network so that it's a very active, dynamic process that interdisciplinarity is fostering, cross-hatching cross-fertilizing, intersecting, transecting. And of course, that would inevitably bring us to be talking as well about the ascendancy of transdisciplinarity. Now, my colleague Christian Pohl is going to talk about transdisciplinarity more in his separate speech, but to give it some context. When the terms, and I've got here, back to your handout here on the back side there, the distinction between inter and transdisciplinarity, the most common criterion for interdisciplinarity you see there is integration. With transdisciplinarity, the prefix trans signifies what another kind of process that's transcending to create more comprehensive or synthetic frameworks. And we've seen since the um, latter, again, the latter half of the 20th century, general systems, sustainability. I've listed also feminist theory and cultural critique as well as that holistic paradigm of health and wellness. And in the late 20th century, it became more closely associated with a cluster of works that you see there in the upper middle of the PowerPoint slide. That is, it became associated with problem-oriented research that crosses the boundaries of academics and public sectors. And it's been associated as well with another term from that word cloud you were looking at, the image on the upper left, the new production of knowledge by Gibbons and colleagues associating transdisciplinarity with a completely new way, not only of doing science, but a relationship of science and society that starts to transfigure even the notion of expertise. We also have, as I mentioned before, we're fortunate enough to have representatives in Canberra from the Science of Team Science movement. They'll be talking more about what is afoot there, and the Team Science Toolkit, which collect together <clears throat> a lot of the transdisciplinary work in health care and in health research. We have, in addition, our hosts, our integration and implementation science hosts, and I wanted to call to attention as well two very important works that deal with different methods for doing transdisciplinary and collaborative work. I'm glad that the Matthias Bergman has been able to join you. You see in the upper right-hand corner there his methods for, he and his colleagues have done methods for transdisciplinary research. And of course, Gabrielle and her colleagues, the research integration using dialogue methods. 
so those are certainly that's uh, a good background we see that we have a concept that has been evolving and I speak of the ascendancy of transdisciplinarity because that's exactly what's been going on it's become more prominent so if we move on to the next slide this is just sort of a dramatic visual that depicts a kind of digital horizon today and I'm very much struck here by the power of this conference being not only in Canberra but in so many different areas of the world with virtual participation and co-conferences a very exciting concept that <clears throat> occurs because of the power of new technologies this is just a, a sketch of a particular cluster of work one of the things that's been very powerful is we've been able to get past static taxonomies of knowledge that were written down in books and through new technologies do visual mapping of where work is occurring in the field this has been a very important way of seeing the interdisciplinary research that's going on Kati Burner and her colleagues have done a number of striking mappings of science that start to render visible new interdisciplinary fields of interest that may not be occurring as visibly in the curriculum yet but are part of the research profile so you can see in the upper right hand corner there the typical ways we've begun to think about science as a result it's dynamic it's flexible we can track it it's transactional and the power of new controlled thesauri which are more sensitive to the new keywords that are emerging not just the old disciplinary vocabularies semantic mapping as we've seen here two tag clouds what a tag cloud such as the wordle for this conference does is to map a relationship in a new way and can it can map it at crosswalks and it can also map it at differing degrees of granularity so we begin to see science in a new way now what does this the implications for I2S and interdisciplinarity I was very struck by the fact that so when Gabrielle and her colleagues put the conference together they thought that the most likely candidate pools for the kind of community we hope continues to roll out from this first international conference would be people who are working on theoretical foundations of interdisciplinarity people who are doing practical research on real-world problems and also people who are working on relevant concepts and methods and so in the audience our multiple audiences across the world we have a lot of those people and I think I wanted to give a metaphor for thinking about what we could move towards in the future it's from uh, my field of digital humanities John Unsworth who's a prominent figure in this field um, I mentioned him in the book I gave you a snapshot of the book here so you could go look at the commentary for a fuller description but he has a wonderful quote there for what I think is the greatest potential of this meeting that is he said that the introduction of web 2.0 shifted emphasis from the computer as a platform fixed single instrument to the network as a platform so that the platform for our work becomes not just our individual domains but it becomes looking at the quote again the network of interaction and synergies that ensues so what would an I2S College of Peers look like well it beckons exactly that metaphor that it would become a network platform that is not possible with current groups that operate not just separately but in tandem they may operate and Gabrielle had a wonderful introduction to the very premise of the conference when she said well here's this one person who doesn't know this other person's work and so what we're really doing here is making that web 2.0 shift if you will with lots of exciting possibilities for thinking into the future what might come uh, this is just a cluster here of the digital posters I went to the digital posters and I was looking for the intersections with interdisciplinarity I noticed at the top there in yellow that interdisciplinarity was most often in those 
wonderful digital posters associated with themes of sustainability, environment, climate change, agriculture, and health, which is a great recapitulation of what I was saying at the start. What are the drivers for interdisciplinarity? And in these areas, too, we also see increased theme work. But I was particularly struck when looking at the other digital posters. If you look, and I've got the numbers there so you can look them up at your leisure more about what the intersections were. If you look in that cluster on the upper left, that there are quite a number that are interested in the nature of collaboration and people working jointly, not only jointly in research, but taking action, as well as integration and communication. Integration being, again, remember from our handout, that benchmark term for interdisciplinarity and communication certainly being key to interdisciplinary collaboration. I'm pleased to see also over on the far right there, there is a cluster of digital posters that think about interdisciplinary education. Change does not ever truly occur unless it becomes embedded in education. So I would hope as we make that web 2.0 shift that we're very mindful of the need to make sure that whatever we want to happen is embedded well into education. They're also down on the lower right. I clustered together a number of the digital posters that are dealing with the nature of interdisciplinary research, including Catherine Lyle and colleagues' wonderful book, which is on your bibliography or your beginning resources. I've got on the back side of your handout places for you to start. And I genuinely mean that only to start because there's a huge literature on interdisciplinarity and Catherine Lyle and colleagues book interdisciplinary research journeys misspelled there but it's a journeys that it is a wonderful place to start to get an overview of how you structure intellectually and socially interdisciplinary research and how to think about it in institutions but also work on historical perspectives and then methods and factors and finally to close up on the far right, I've clustered together a number of digital poster numbers that deal with the institutionalized of interdisciplinarity in the university and in funding agencies. But I particularly want to call attention to the bottom three. I'm very pleased that Rick Shostak is with you in Canberra. You'll be hearing from Rick. And Rick uh, talks about a number of initiatives in the Association for Interdisciplinary Studies, including one I think is so crucial to this Web 2.0 shift I was talking about for this international group that is codifying the knowledge base. I've also Machio Keister's number 663 poster on the International Network for Interdisciplinary and Transdisciplinary Research is working in alliance with AIS and with TDNet, the transdisciplinary network that, again, Christian Pohl will talk about more. So there, I think this is a very positive, forward-looking picture of what the intersections are for interdisciplinarity. So I'm going to, we're going to stop this recording now and hope that one of the wonderful technological devices we have will enable us to have a few minutes of Q&A. So I trust I'll see you soon there. Okay, well, we, uh, we have um, some time for uh, questions and answers. And uh, welcome, Julie. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, I don't know what time it is, uh, where you are, um, but uh, thank you. It's almost 8 o'clock at night. Okay, yeah. well, thank you for staying up so late for joining with us. Um, so let's uh, kick off with some questions. If you can introduce yourself. Um. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Liz Bolton. I'm from the Fenner School at ANU, um, which looks at environment um, and social studies. Um, thank you for that fantastic overview. I just had a very basic question for you. Um, with the useful... Um, table you have of terms, um, would you consider cross-disciplinary the same as multidisciplinary? Oh, Liz, thank you for your question. That's an excellent question. I want to make sure you can hear me. Can you? Yes, we can. Super, thanks. Cross-disciplinary is usually used as an adjective to refer to any form of boundary crossing. So it's not so much synonymous with multidisciplinary as 
crossing any kind of boundary. So uh, I took a look. The term gets, all of these terms get used differently, but most often it's meant in that sort of generic sense of crossing. Another question over here. Uh, I'm Jenny Stewart from UNSW Canberra. I'm wondering what the implications of transdisciplinarity um, are for research methods. Are, are we talking some kind of super positivism here? Um, where do you see research methods going? Jenny, that's an excellent caveat that you're raising, that we have the danger here. Gabrielle, I think, is anticipating this in a way when she talks about the controversy that surrounds the suggestion of creating a new discipline. There are some transdisciplinary approaches that have aimed to be new super methodologies, such as, um, well, this general systems theory, feminist theory, but I see research methods as occurring all across that spectrum of definitions. And um, there is a current push, I referred to it in the presentation, for convergence as a concept, the idea that we would create an actual macro set of disciplines and interdisciplinary fields coming together. I think that's a rather lofty ambition. So what we tend to see more is a plurality of different methods and deployed in different contexts. So rather than one new and especially positivist or imperialist methodology, what we see is a host of different methods. It's one of the reasons why <clears throat> I'm glad that Matthias Bergman is with you and that you have a chance to look at Gabriel's book too because one of the things they're insisting on is that we look at methods in context and see that methods individually or in combination do not create necessarily a macro picture, but we have to find out what their suitability is in context. So thank you for raising this question. It's an important concern. Another question here. Um, <clears throat> thank you for an excellent presentation, Julie. Uh, my name's Liz Clark from the Fenner School at ANU. Um, my question is in relation to the difference between interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. Um, I'm interested you talk about um, transcending and transgressing. Um, one of the issues with uh, going beyond disciplines is you have a, it's some very different epistemologies and even ontologies. Um, and it's not just a matter of language, it's a whole matter of worldviews. How do you see us um, not only transcending that, but, um, but making use of that in research? Uh, Liz, could you give me a bit more context first, though? Could you tell me when you say research, are you talking about research on complex problems or research in particular domains? Um, okay, well, I'll use the example of the area I work in. I work in agriculture, um, dealing with issues like food security, um, rural poverty, um, in the international um, sphere. So we're bringing together a lot of different disciplines, plus we're trying to go beyond disciplines. And what we see is there's a lot of um, very strong contestations between worldviews, and they're very difficult to bring together. Convergence is very difficult, and in some senses, divergence is the only way we can really um, tackle some of these complex or wicked problems. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Further, agriculture is a great example of exactly what we're talking about here. I think these things are all simultaneous. I agree with you that convergence is a very lofty ambition, and it's nearly impossible, except often in an epistemological construct or in particular, especially elite think tanks, to really bring together at a high level different fields. But we have to look also at mid-level and look at micro-level and to see that inter- and transdisciplinarity sort out in different ways depending on the complexity, the scale, the size, the scope of particular research projects. So I see them <clears throat> as occurring simultaneously but very different in terms of the kind of work that's getting done, whether or not there's a particular problem-focused project at a smaller level or there is a larger epistemological 
ambition and even an ontological premise. So you you had it right from the start, I think, in trying to sort those things through, while also appreciating that the difficulty of a macro universalist transdisciplinarity bodes ill for such an occurrence. So it's something to keep in mind throughout this conference too about how feasible it is to have a new discipline that does cut across all others. I think we have time for one more question um, here at the back. <laughs> Um, hi, Julie. I'm Linda Neuhauser from the University of California, Berkeley. And I wanted to say how much I appreciated your talk. It was a wonderful um, overview and very deep. And I, I have a practical question for you. Is it possible for us to um, get copies of your talk so we can use it in classes and other places where we would like to introduce what you know to students and colleagues? Uh, absolutely. And Linda, it's great to meet you at last. Uh, we've been emailing back and forth for some time. Absolutely. Gabrielle referred to a data repository of all items from this conference. I don't know exactly how that's, that's going to be handled, but I'm sure it will be explained. And I'm an open access person. As far as I'm concerned, give everything away. So um, I have sent in the PD, a PDF file of the slides and of the handout, and I'm if um, we'll find a way to get the recording to you. So I'll defer to our hosts about how that repository will be handled. But yes, of course. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Julie, and uh, thank you, uh, Gabrielle, for two uh, terrific uh, presentations, and also to the audience, uh, both online and here. Uh, for some great questions. So we'll keep the discussion and uh, dialogue uh, continuing. Um, so if you can join with me in thanking everyone.